I'm going to invite you to open your Bible this morning to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, as we continue through our studies in this epistle, and Paul is really teaching us how to live a life that is marked by joy. A life that is marked by joy. Too often times we focus on our, on our circumstances. We focus on our problems. And we begin to panic. We begin to worry about the future, about what is next. Very distracted in regards to what God's calling us to do right now. But we see here, even through Paul's life, as he is in Roman house arrest, there in Rome, waiting for his trial to Caesar, that God was using his circumstances, that God was using those that were criticizing him, that God was using even his condition, his present condition, for his own glory. You think about what he's mentioned before already in Philippians 1, is that because of Paul's circumstances and him being arrested there in the palace guard, he was able to take the gospel to places where otherwise would not have been open to hear the message of Jesus. And many there, many Roman soldiers were able to be saved because of the message that Paul preached. That although he had critics of those that were criticizing him and jealous of him and competing against him, he said the gospel is still being preached. And that even in his present condition, whether he's facing life or death, he's saying that through this, Christ is magnified. So he becomes a consistent example for us as we're going through suffering, as we're going through trials, as we're going through through tribulations. How can we use those seasons to glorify the Lord? And if there's one thing that we notice through Paul's life and the epistles that he writes is that he is a selfless man. He puts other people first before himself. At the center and the core of who he is, it is Christ. And he puts people first and then himself. He is living the crucified life. In fact, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. I've died to myself. I'm not living for myself. I'm not living for the flesh anymore. And this life that I live in the flesh, in this present day and world, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and he gave himself for me. You think about what Paul is saying, I no longer am living for myself. The moment that I met Jesus, and he transformed my life, now I'm living for Christ. And this is why he can teach us that our joy is directly associated to our relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that today, your joy is directly associated with your relationship with Jesus Christ. When Christ is the center of your life, he changes your attitude about your circumstances. When when Christ means to us the most in life, the opinions of what other people say mean very little. When, When Christ is the center, he calms our fears about the future so that we're not worried. There are too many people today, especially in the church, including in the church, that are worried about the future. And you know that worry kills your joy? When you're worried about tomorrow, you're worried about what's going to happen next. You're worried about your your job, how you're going to make ends meet, maybe. You're worried about where you're going to be three years from now. Maybe you're worried whether or not you're going to get married. Maybe you're worried if you're not going to buy that house. And, And you're uncertain about the future. And here Paul is saying, my future is uncertain but it makes no difference to me. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Too many times we have a problem with the future because we love to hold on to the things of this world. We love to hold on to the things of this world so we have a problem with the future. We also have a problem with the future because we like to control things. I like that word that David gave this last Wednesday where he said the Lord spoke to him and what did he say? Let go. We need to let go of the things of the world so we can have the joy of the Lord. The more that you let go of the world, the more of the joy of the Lord that you will have. Because your focus and your heart will be on Christ. As it's been said before, we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. How many of us can praise the Lord because we know who holds the future? We know who holds the future. 
And because of that, we can walk in joy and in love, in fellowship with the Lord. We don't have to lose the joy of ministry. There's so many people that, that are serving the Lord, they lose the joy in ministry because they took their eyes off Christ and they put it on people. Or you're walking with the Lord and you took your eyes off, off who Christ was and you put your eyes on the church or on someone else. Well, today we are learning how to cultivate the joy of the Lord in our lives. The title of the message is To Live is Christ. Did you write that down? To live is Christ. And we're going to read Philippians chapter 1 from verse 19 to 26. Would you stand with me this morning for the reading of God's word? Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 19, I'll read the odd verses, and you read the even verses out loud together. It says this, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you because you're teaching us how to cultivate joy in our life as we trust in you, that we would be living for your glory. That regardless of the circumstances, that in what the future holds, we know who holds the future, and we trust in you, Lord, We trust in all of your ways, that you have a plan, and you are the one that is in control, not us. In Jesus' name, together we said, amen. You may be seated. So we're going to look at three major things in that text that we just read this morning. Number one, Paul's hope, then Paul's purpose, and then finally, Paul's patience. Where is Paul's hope? Let's look at there, verse 19. And there he describes his confidence in his present circumstance. He's not worried. He's not discouraged. He's certainly not afraid. He has confidence, although he is facing this tribulation, although he's in prison, although he is about to face trial to Caesar. And his confidence here is explained by verse 19 when he says, for I know. Now I would encourage you that you would underline that in your Bible, those words, for I know. No, his confidence is in what he knows. His confidence is not in how he feels. His confidence is not in what people are saying about him. If you're always concerned about how you feel or what other people think about you, you will quickly lose your joy. But he's saying, I have confidence right here in my present circumstance because of what I know. And what is it that he knows? Well, his confidence is in the precepts of God, in God's precepts. His confidence is in what God has already said, in God's word. Do you remember in Romans chapter 8, what did he say? Verse 28, and we know all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. So he begins here with a strong conviction and confidence. And he says, for I know that the things or this will turn out for my deliverance. I know that the things that I'm going through, I know that all of this will turn out. It means this is temporary. It means this will turn out for what? My deliverance. That word in the original Greek, it means salvation. And I know that the things that I'm going through will only turn out for my salvation, that God will rescue me from my danger. I know that God will and is concerned about my well-being, that he will provide an escape from me, that I will be freed from this temporary distress and that this will not last. Now, do you see that he's trusting in the Lord right here? 
he knows that this will turn out for his deliverance. Why? Because he's trusting in the Lord. You see, when you know God, you're able to trust in him. If you don't know God, you cannot trust in him. But he says, because I know him, I can trust in him. The psalmist David, as he was running from Saul, hiding in caves, fighting battles in the wilderness, notice what he writes in Psalms 22, verse 4. David says this, our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. The same thing that Paul is saying here. I know that God's going to deliver me out of this. His confidence in what, is in what he knows. Psalms, 20, Psalms 34, verse 19. David then says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions that the righteous will go through, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. What a promise we have today, that we will go through afflictions, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. So his confidence is in the precepts of God and what God has already said. But also notice his confidence, number two, is in prayer. First in the word and then in prayer. If you're going through a situation right now, maybe concerned about the future, I want you to put your confidence in God's word, number one. Number two, put your confidence in prayer because he says this, my deliverance will come through your prayers. Notice verse 19, through your prayers. What is he saying? This is the channel by which my deliverance will be by. I know that this will require prayer, and it's the prayers of the church for Paul. Did you know even as you're serving the Lord right now, maybe you're doing a spiritual work, if you're serving in ministry, notice what he's saying, and he's describing the priority and the confidence that we can have in prayer. Because spiritual work requires spiritual tools. You can't do a spiritual work in the energy or in the strength of your flesh. We must allow the Spirit of God to work as we commit ourselves to pray. Did you know the quickest way to quench the Spirit of God in the church? The quickest way to quench the Spirit of God in the life of the Christian is when you fail to pray, when you resist to pray. What is it that we need to do consistently even as we're going through certain circumstances and seasons of life that are difficult, that we would give ourselves over to prayer. I love what Leonard Ravenhill says in his book, Why Revival Tarries. He says, no man is greater than his prayer life. The people who are not praying are strained. We have many organizers and very few agonizers, many players and payers, but few prayers, many singers, but very few clingers, many wrestlers, but few wrestlers, many who are enterprising, but few who are interceding. A worldly Christian will stop praying, but a praying Christian will stop worldliness. Ties may build a church, but tears will give it life. How many of us know today that we need prayer so that we would have spiritual life in the church? Amen. And this is exactly what he's saying. I know that my deliverance is going to be through prayer because God's purposes work through the prayers of his people. And they were praying on behalf of Paul. It's important that we learn to pray for one another. It's so encouraging when someone tells you, you know what, I'm praying for you. Because you know the spirit of God works through prayer. You know the spirit of God is working through the prayers of his people. In fact, in Romans chapter 15, verse 30, Paul asks for prayers from the people. And he says this, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. We should never resist asking people to pray for us. He said here, I am going through tribulation. I pray, I beg you, I'm asking you, by the love of Christ, that you strive together in prayers to God for me. So he knew his deliverance would come because his confidence was in the precepts of God, and he knew his deliverance would come because of the power of prayer. But finally, number three, in verse 19, he knew his deliverance would come because of the supply of the Spirit. Notice what he says there in verse 19, through prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. 
there we have those three key elements. That as you're going through tribulation, as we're facing suffering, we can have joy. We can experience deliverance. We can walk in confidence because of the word of God, because of the power of prayer, and because of the help of the Spirit. Now, he speaks of the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the help of the Spirit. And that word there in verse 19, the word supply means, is, is from the word that we receive, chorus. I mean, think of a, a big choir or a chorus singing. It's one voice building upon another voice. So he speaks of abundant resources there. And he says, I know my deliverance is going to come because of the abundant resources or the generous resources of the Spirit of God. And those abundant resources are going to meet my needs. Now his confidence, notice this, it's not in his experience. His confidence is not in who he knows. His confidence is not in his own strength. It's not in his very futile and weak resources. But it's in the generous resources of God. He, know, he says, I know that because of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to have empowerment every single day to endure this troubling situation that I'm in. What is he depending upon? The word, prayer, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so many times we find ourselves in situations and we think, I don't know how much longer I can take of this. <laughs> when is this suffering going to end already, Lord? Or I can't see myself doing that which God called me to do. It's going to be a miracle of God. I'm underqualified. I need the Lord. <laughs> you know what you can go back to? You can know that by the word of God, by prayer, and by the Holy Spirit, God will meet every single one of your needs. That by the word of God, by prayer, and by the Holy Spirit, he's going to meet every single one of your needs. We remember, somebody wants to clap about that. They're, they're excited about God meeting their needs. We remember in the Old Testament, in Zechariah, what happened there? That the Lord spoke to Zerubbabel, the governor, to rebuild the temple of God. And he said, how can I do this? This task and assignment seems impossible. The work before us is, is overwhelming. And the Lord spoke to Zerubbabel through Zechariah, and he said this, not my might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What is it? How is it that we operate and do God's work? By the Spirit. Confidence in the Word, trusting through prayer, and also relying on the Holy Spirit. Here, he's expressing an attitude, Paul, in verse 19, that his confidence is in the sovereignty of God who is overseeing everything, who is working out every difficult situation, who has a plan in everything, and he's in control of all the events in his life. God today is in control of every event of your life. And he is seeing and working it out all through. What did the psalmist say in Psalms 23? Yes, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. And what is he saying? I'm walking through it. That means I'm going to come out of it. That means that God's going to deliver me out of it. That I should not be afraid of where God leads me because the hand of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. What does that mean? That no matter where he leads you, no matter where he takes you, his grace is sufficient to give you strength and to keep you there. So notice verse 20, as he says here, this important statement of faith. After he's expressed this confidence, he says, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. And notice Paul here with a strong conviction. He says, I know God's going to deliver me according to the earnest expectation. Here he gives us a picture of someone with an outstretched head looking and focusing afar off, trying to focus in on an object far away, straining to focus on it. In fact, he's saying an earnest expectation speaks of a sharp anticipation of the future. <laughs> He said, I'm looking towards the future. I'm focusing in on what is coming next. Not only with an earnest expectation, but notice, and a hope. And the hope that he talks about, it's not wishful thinking where he's saying, I hope things turn out well. No, it's not that. It's a confident anticipation and expectation of what is to come. 
that he is not fearful of the future. In fact, notice what he's saying. I'm looking towards the future with confidence. As you know, today, as you look to God's word, that you, as you go to God in prayer, and as you rely on the Holy Spirit, you can look towards the future with confidence. This is exactly what Paul is doing. He's in the word. He's receiving the prayers. He's relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. So he says, I'm looking towards the future with confidence, knowing that in nothing I will be ashamed. Now notice what he says there in verse 19, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. I look towards the future with confidence because I know God will never let me down. (laughs) What an assurance he has. I'm looking towards what's next because God has never let me down and he will not start now. He will not turn against me because I know God is for me and I'll never be ashamed. I want you to know this. Those who trust in the Lord will never be ashamed. If you trust in the Lord today, you'll never be ashamed. David said it well himself. He said, oh my God, Psalms 25 verse 2, I trust in you. Let me never be ashamed. You know why oftentimes we're let down very easily? Why oftentimes we're confused? We're discouraged? Because we put our trust in something other than God. Because you put your confidence in a man instead of in the Lord. Because you put your confidence in a job instead of in God's plan. Because you put your confidence in your plan instead of God's timing. So he says here, I'm fully surrendered. I'm fully submitted to God. I'm looking towards the future with confidence and in anticipation, knowing that God will not let me down. I'm not afraid. In fact, notice what he says here, because he describes himself as a person that knows he's in God's will. Yes, he may be in house arrest, but he's in the center of God's will. I want you to know that even today, maybe you're waiting for the Lord to take you to that next season. And as he has you waiting, you know what he has you in? In the center of his will. (laughs) Maybe you're going through a trial right now and you find yourself consistently in this battle. And you're in the battle, but guess what you also are in? In the center of God's will. You're, you're, You're waiting for the Lord to answer your prayer. And as you're waiting for that answer, guess who you also are in? in the center of God's will. There is never a better place to be in than in the center of God's will. And Paul here is expressing that, that he knows he's in God's will, so he says this, I look forward, not ashamed, but in fact, with all boldness. Would you circle that in your Bible? I'm not afraid, I'm not ashamed, in fact, I'm walking towards the future with boldness as always. He uses that word as always. Because he's now remembering, he's describing that as in the past, he's always walked with boldness. That word boldness means freedom of speech. That as always, I'll speak with freedom of speech. Boldness means I'm fearless of what's coming. I'm not afraid. I'm not timid. I'm not shying away from things. My confidence is in the Lord. That's why he was bold. You want to know how you can be bold today, how you can be courageous for what God has in your life? Put your confidence in the Lord because that's where true boldness comes from. When you fear God, you have nothing else to fear. (laughs) When we fear the Lord, we, we ought to not fear anything else. And here he's saying, my confidence is in what God is doing. He has taken hold of God's promises and he's not letting go. So he says, with all boldness now, because I know God is on my side and I'm standing for the truth. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed. I know what God's calling me to do. Today, if you know what God's calling you to do, walk in the confidence of your calling. Walk in the confidence of your calling. Do not be afraid of what other people think or what other people say. There are too many times that we fail to do what God has called us to do because we're scared or what other people are going to say if we do those things. We're not speaking out in boldness because we're afraid of rejection. You see, he was not afraid of rejection because his confidence was in the Lord. He was walking in obedience. I love what Howard Hendricks said when he said this, in the midst of a generation that's screaming for answers, Christians are stuttering. Why is it that Christians are stuttering today? 
Oftentimes, it's because we haven't put our confidence in the Lord. We are not to walk in fear. We are to walk in boldness. And that only comes by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. What did Paul tell Timothy? For the Lord has not given you a spirit of what? Fear, but of a power of love and of a sound mind. God's not called you to be timid or to shy away. God's called you to walk in confidence that he is in control and he is the one that's overseeing all of these events. So he says in verse 20, as he continues, with all boldness as always, so now Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Well, look at the, the conviction in his, in his words. There are so many times that we, go, we start struggling through trials that God interrupts our plans. You know quickly what happens when God interrupts our plans? We become very insecure. <laughs> well, God, you said this was going to happen. And oftentimes God allows detours to take place in the plan to teach us new lessons. To teach us new lessons. But he was not insecure. He was confident that God was doing something bigger than himself. So he says, I know that Christ will be magnified in my body. That word magnified means to, to make great. I know through this soul in my body, God will be made great, or it means to make enlarge. I will enlarge him in my body. That means that I will reflect the Lord Jesus Christ so that others can see him through my life. I know that in spite of the circumstances, I'm going to make myself an instrument in the hands of God. Do you know why oftentimes we do not learn the lesson in the struggle that we're going through? Because we make it harder than it needs to be <laughs> by resisting the hand of God in our life. And he's saying, I'm an instrument in God's hands so that others would get to know him and that he would be magnified, that I will be an example of Christ through blessing and through suffering. The word magnified means to enlarge. In, in fact, think about a telescope. When you look through a telescope, what happens? You make something that looks very far away look very up close and clear. And here what he's saying is that I am going to bring Christ closer I'm going to magnify close, God, Christ closer to other people, to the unsaved, to those that don't know him. Jesus is brought closer as they watch Paul go through suffering and through these crisis experiences. Well, what, what an example he is for us. That even through the situation that you're going through, that you would say, I want to bring Christ closer and make him clearer to those that don't know him through this experience. So what is he saying? My life, body, soul, and spirit are submitted, are surrendered to God's will. And, and, and we read this, this verse and we think about this, as Paul would say, that he was not living to promote himself. He was not living to try to protect his life. He was not living to preserve his life, oh, but he was living only to, for one thing, for the glory of God, for the glory of God. He wasn't holding on to his life. You want to you really forfeit your joy today? Then hold on to the things of this world. Then hold on to your life. That's the fastest way to lose your joy. Here he's saying, I'm not holding on to anything. I'm letting go of everything because my confidence is in the plan of God, whether by, verse 20, life or death. It doesn't matter what happens, whether by life or by death, it makes no difference to me as long as Christ is exalted through me. You think about the, the amount of obedience and surrender it takes, of submission it takes for you to truly believe this, that it doesn't matter what happens as long as Christ is glorified and I trust that my body is bringing honor to him. I will boldly face whatever comes my way so as long as Christ is glorified. It doesn't matter. I'll allow Christ to be glorified through it. You think about what they thought because in Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas were in prison there in Philippi, Macedonia, what happened? They were praying, they were singing at midnight, and then they were delivered from their trial. They were delivered from their problem. Now Paul is teaching them that they can be delivered in the midst 
of their problem by putting their eyes on Jesus. And in it, God will be glorified. Have you ever noticed that we're so good at putting parameters on God? We'll say, God, you can be glorified in my life through blessing. (laughs) Would you glorify yourself in my life through blessing? But Paul is saying here, I want you to know that God can be glorified in my life, even through suffering. Because I know that he is in control. And I'm not holding on to my life. If he needed to lay lay down his life, notice what he's saying. He was pleased at the opportunity. There's so many people that are worried about their lives. They're worried about when they will die. Don't worry about when you'll die. You know what? One thing is sure if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, that we're all going to die. But if you put your trust in Jesus, you're going to be in heaven and you're going to meet with him in the air. You don't have to be worried about that. (laughs) Don't be worried about when you'll die. Instead, focus on how you'll live. I'm not going to be worried about how I'll die or when I'll die. I'm going to focus on how I can live today. That's exactly what he's saying. Don't hold on to your future. Don't hold on to your life. Let those things go. Don't hold on to a career, a a, a position. Don't hold on to anything so that you can glorify God. When you start to hold on to things, you know what that becomes? What you have in your hands? Idols. Anything that you're unwilling to let go of, you know what it is? An idol. And it's come in the way of you and Christ. It has robbed you of your joy because your joy is now dependent on what you have in your hands instead of if you're in the hands of God. Notice what he says, Jesus, in Matthew 16. For whomsoever desires to save his life, what is he going to do? Lose it. Give it up. (laughs) Give up your life. Everybody wants security in this world. Give up your life. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? You can't take it with you anyway. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. Are you truly living for Christ? Or are you living for yourself? Because you can say you're living for Christ. You can tell people you're living for Christ. But the Lord knows if you're truly living for him or for yourself. You know, you know when it, you really know you're living for the Lord is when he asks you for that which he has blessed you with. When he asks you that which he has blessed you with, then you know who you're truly living for. I remember when the Lord called me a few years ago after we had planted a church to move the church to this church. And I said, Lord, no way. <laughs> what are you doing, Lord? Why would you ask me to do that? And I remember always telling the Lord, you know, and the people, well, the, pa- the Lord is a pastor of this church, and the Lord is a pastor of the church. And one time in prayer, after I was struggling with this, the Lord asked me, is this your church or is this my church? And I said, Lord, this is your church. Then he said, then what's the problem? Move the church. <laughs> and guess what? The Lord was glorified in it. Amen. <laughs> So Paul is confident in God's plan. And today we need to be confident in God's plan. That we we look at heaven as he's looking towards heaven, knowing that it's not only a future destination. We don't look to heaven as, yes, one day we will go to heaven and make it there. But we know that it's a present motivation. Heaven should motivate the way you live your life today. That you are living a life by faith. That you understand you are a sojourner, that you are passing by, that this is not for, this is temporary. Remember that today. The life that we live is very temporary. Don't become enamored with the things of this world. Do not, because then you'll have a problem. Notice here, we see Paul's hope. Now look, verse 21, Paul's purpose. And he says this very strong, convicting verse that we all know it, In fact, let's read it out loud together. He says this, what? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That is the purpose as to why he lives. In fact, when you read that verse, this is what Paul is saying. As far as I'm concerned, (laughs) after he said whether by life or death, you know what he said? As far as I'm concerned, I've made a decision. Have you made a decision? I want to ask you that. Have you made a decision 
about the way that you're going to live your life? Or are you going to live your life for yourself a selfish way or a selfless way where you lay your life down for Christ? As far as I'm concerned, to live is Christ. Now, why is it that he says to live is Christ? I want you to know this. Write this down. Three things that it means to live as Christ. Number one, your faith. Faith in Christ. To live as Christ because you put your faith in Christ. To live as Christ because you fellowship with Christ. And to live is Christ because you follow Christ. This is how you know if you truly can say and are living this out to live as Christ. Do you have faith in Christ? Are you fellowshipping with Christ? And are you following Christ? For me to live is Christ. You see, he's not living for himself. He's not saying for me to live is this house. He's not saying for me to live is this car. Or for me to live is my girlfriend. (laughs) Or money, or possessions, or position. You know what he's saying? For me to live is the Lord. There was nothing in this world that had power over him. That's when you really have to pause and ask yourself the question. Is there anything in this world, is there anything in this life that has power over you right now? Because if it has power over you, guess what? You're living for that. You're living for that. If it's the first thing you think about in the morning and the last thing you think about before you go to sleep, guess what? It has power over you. Here he's saying to live is Christ. There is nothing in this life that was a hindrance between himself and the Lord. There was nothing that stood in the way. There was no hindrances between himself and Christ. What did Jesus say in Matthew 22? You shall love the Lord your God with what? All of your hearts. He's saying, I love the Lord with all of my heart, that for me to live is Christ, and dying is even better. He calls it gain. And to die is gain because it would mean that I would be with Christ. It would relieve me of this earthly burden. So when you look at Paul's statement, he's not looking as, at death as defeat. Do not look at death as defeat if you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Because he knows that he is going to be with Christ Jesus. It's a graduation to glory. When, when we as Christians know of others who've put their faith in Jesus Christ, we, we don't say, you know, we lost a brother or a sister or a friend. We didn't lose them. You lose something, you don't know where it's at. We know where they're at. They're in the presence of God. They're in, in glory. And he was yielded and he was surrendered to God. He's saying to live means to live for him and to die means to be with him. <laughs> Think about that. I'm reminded of Acts chapter 21. What did Paul say? They told him, don't go to Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem to preach there, there are those waiting for you, the Jews. They're going to beat you and put you into prison in chains. And you know what he said to Paul? He said, that doesn't worry me. <laughs> what he says, I'm ready not only to be bound, I'm ready to die in Jerusalem for the sake of the gospel. <laughs> I'm not concerned about those things. I'm not afraid. Why are you so afraid, Christian? Why are you so afraid? Notice he said, and to die is gain. If you don't know how to live for him, how will you ever die for him? How will you ever die for him? He's living on earth responsibly while looking towards heaven ultimately here. And he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Ask yourself that question. Write that in your Bible. Even as you take notes, for me to live is, and then put blank. For you to live is what? Because if for you to live is making money, then to die is loss. Because you can't take it with you. (laughs) If for you to live is your house, then to die is loss, because you can't take that with you either. What is the thing that you live for? Do you truly live for Christ? Are you truly waiting for heaven? We need to be Christians that have joy because we think one day we will be in heaven. You think about it, you have something to look forward to. That, that, that's a good enough reason to have joy today. <laughs> that you have something to look, you have a destination to look forward, and it's to heaven. Sometimes we say, Lord Maranatha, come quickly, Lord. Would you just come? Just come after August, because I really have something important to do in August. We should be able to say, Lord, there's nothing better 
than to be in heaven, to be in glory with Jesus Christ. What's better than that? I heard a story of a, of a little five-year-old girl that said, the good thing about heaven is that you don't have to do homework there. And then she said, unless your teacher is there too. <laughs> Are you looking forward to heaven that you can say to live is Christ, to die is gain? That is what matters to me the most. That is my priority. That is the kingdom mindset mentality that I have. And then he goes on, he says, but if I live in the flesh, because now he's wrestling here with a few things. He's also wanting, he's willing, and he says this. Notice in verse 22, but if I live on in the flesh, this shall mean fruit to my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. He said, but I live on in the flesh. What does it mean, fruit to my labor? If I continue in this life, I know what I, can, what I need to do. I need to work fruitfully, faithfully, diligently for the Lord. To see the gospel preached and others be saved. If I continue to live, what does it mean? More opportunity for victory for Christ. Every single day is another opportunity for you to live for Christ. Every day you live is another opportunity for the glory of God. Think about it every day you wake up. Today is another opportunity for the glory of God. And this is why he says more fruit to my labor. It means I can do more for Christ. I haven't lost joy. I have a lot of anticipation. God has given me another reason for fruit to my labor. Now, the Bible speaks of fruit in several ways. In fact, Paul explains fruit as he mentions it in different epistles that he's written. In Romans 1.13, write this down, Romans 113, he explains fruit as salvations or fruit as converts. Romans 113, he says, Now I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that as often I planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. But he's saying, I pray that there would be some fruit among you. I pray that some would be saved among you. Fruit. And scripture is given to us as an illustration as converts salvation. But also as holiness. Write that down as well. Holiness. Romans 6, 22. Paul tells the church of Rome, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness. You have your fruit to holiness. What does fruit look like in the life of the Christian? It looks like a life of holiness. Not only like salvations, but also a life of holiness. And then number three, fruit also looks like giving. You want to live a fruitful life? Then ask the Lord to use you to lead others to Christ. Ask the Lord to also work in your life for holiness. And also to give you a desire to give. In Romans 15, verse 26 and 28, through those verses, he says, Therefore, when I have performed this, and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by the way to you to Spain. What is he saying? When I give them this offering, when I give them this generous contribution and gift, he relates it as fruit. The people that are fruitful are those that are very generous. So he says salvations, holiness, giving. What about this? Good works. Good works is also fruit. Colossians 1.10, he tells the church there in Colossae, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, that you would put your hands to serve the Lord. I know that I have the opportunity, Paul is saying, to see more be saved, to walk in holiness, to be generous, to work more good works, and finally, to praise. Fruit also looks like praise. It was in Hebrews 13, verse 15, that he wrote this. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips. When we offer to God praise, you know what you're offering to him? Fruit, the fruit of our lips. He says, but here in this verse 22, as he's saying, I have more opportunity for fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. 
Yet what is coming, I can't tell. That word tell means reveal, or I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the Lord will do in my life. In fact, he's saying, I can see the advantages, whether I go through this and the Lord delivers me and spares me in life, or I can see the advantages also, even in my death, because I glorify the Lord and then I'm with him. Just, but I cannot tell what God wants for me right now. So until I can tell, then I can't tell you. He was waiting to understand what God's will for, was for him next. And he says, there's these two options, and I feel hard-pressed between the two. Let's read those verses 23 and 24, because he says, for I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. I'm struggling with this. I'm wrestling. Notice, write this word down, wrestling. He was wrestling with this. He said, I'm torn between the prospect of seeing the Lord, but also with the passion that I have to minister to the church of Philippi. In fact, that word where it says, hard pressed between the two, he's speaking of a traveler that is going down a narrow path with two rock walls on either side of him with no option to go anywhere else but straight. And what he's saying here is that things are closing in on me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm now closed in on these two difficult options. You know what you have to ask yourself when you have two difficult options as a believer of Jesus Christ? Ask yourself, do I want God's glory or do I want my comfort? Do I want God's glory or do I want my comfort? Ask yourself, will this please me or will this please the Lord? Don't look to be pleased for yourself. Look to please the Lord. Don't worry to secure your future. There's too many people that are worrying to secure their future. And in, in, in the midst of that, you know what they do? They forfeit their calling. They forfeit their calling. Paul wasn't into himself. He wasn't crying about his future. He knew his future was in the hands of God. It was in the, not in how much money he had. Not in what he had set up for himself. His future was in the hands of God. He was not into himself. You know what he was into? He was into God. That's what he was into. So many people choose the wrong path when they're in the midst of two difficult options. I want you to know this. Just because it doesn't contradict the Bible, it doesn't mean it's God's will for your life. So many people say, well, if it doesn't contradict the Bible, that means it's God's will for my life. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Ask God through Scripture, give me confirmation through your word that it, it is your will for my life. So that you can say truly, my life is in the hands of God. And notice what he says as he's wrestling. I have a desire. I'm wanting, I'm wrestling, but I'm also wanting, I long to be with Christ. This intense desire. And he uses this word here. Notice verse 23, to depart. The word depart, it's, it's a part of his profession of Paul. Depart would mean that you would strike down a tent. He was a tent maker. And that you would move the tent and take the tent to a different place. And he was saying, I'm ready to take this tent down and move it somewhere else. <laughs> he didn't see death as the end of life. He saw it now as he's moving from one home to the other. This is just a tent. And notice what he says, and be with Christ, which is far better. Being with Christ is far better. You've heard those people say, you know, if I die, you better not pray me back. <laughs> I'll be with Christ. His desire is for heaven. I'm ready to strike down the tent and move elsewhere if I need to. I'm not in love with this world. I'm in love with the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 8, what does he say? For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well, please, rather to be absent from the body. What does it mean? It means to be present with the Lord. I'm prepared to stay or go as God pleases. Nevertheless, verse 24 to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. What is better for you? This is what I love about Paul. He's a selfless leader. He doesn't say what's better for me. He's a servant leader. He says, what is better for the people? When I think about my future, look at this. Look how selfless this is. When I think about my future, what is better for these people? 
Because if I think about my future and it's not better for them, then I don't want it. When I think about my future, what is better for these people? There's so many people that think about themselves first and then they hurt a lot of people. You end up hurting a lot of people. What does he do? He puts the needs of the people first. He puts their needs first. Why? Because he loves God and he loves the people. He wants what's best for them. He's dying to his desire because he's caring for the people. He's shepherding them. What did Jesus say in Matthew 16, 24? If anyone desires to come after me, let him what? Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I pray that when you think about your future, you think about what's best for other people. And then notice what he says here. You see first Paul's hope, then you see Paul's purpose, and then finally Paul's patience, 25 and 26. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. What is that word progress? We looked at it a few weeks ago. It means the furtherance to advance, to now trailblaze so that others can go further. He's saying, I want to be here to minister to you so that you can further and advance and mature spiritually. I'm willing to stay here so I can see other people grow spiritually. I'm willing to submit to God's plan, even though I'd rather leave (laughs) because I want to see them grow spiritually but also, and grow up in joy. Because he says, enjoy a faith. Enjoy a faith. That is the, the number one characteristic of the church, love and joy. When you go into a church, you walk into a church, you know what you should sense when you walk into a church, when you meet a Christian? You should sense the love of God. And you know how the love of God oftentimes is expressed through joy. If you go to a church and there is no joy there, guess what there is? Also no love. <laughs> but if you go into a church and there is joy, it's a It's the overflow of love. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And he says this finally in verse 26, as we come to an end, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ, that you would find another reason to rejoice in Jesus Christ as you see the work that he is doing through me by my coming to you again. What is it that we are to do today, this morning, church? Set your mind on things that are above. Do not focus on things of the earth. Set your mind on things that are above. The more you think about what pleases the Lord, the more that you're able to live for the glory of God. If you keep fighting for things of this earth, notice what happens. That life does not glorify God. You know what kind of life glorifies God? When you let go and you submit to what God wants. He says in Colossians 3, verses 1, if then you have been raised with Christ... Seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind there. Focus on that. Not on things of the earth, for you're died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Now I want you to know something. Today, you can have this confidence that he has by simply making a decision. You're making a decision that you're saying, to, for me to live is Christ and die is gain. That you're saying, I'm going to let go of whatever's holding me back. Whatever you hold on to, notice this. Whatever you hold on to holds you back. Whatever you hold on to holds you back. The only thing you should be holding on to is the promises of God. Is the promises of God. Can we pray?